Fair Lodge. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this uh, beautiful uh, uh, Saturday. Um, I'm Merit Sukovich, I'm Chair of Neurology at uh, Mass General Hospital and the Director of the Healy Center. And we're very excited to have a, um, an afternoon with you to share some uh, real progress in developing treatments for people with ALS. We are going to record uh, this session and then um, post it and share it. Um, if people have questions during the talks, please put them in the Q&A and we, we've left lots of time for questions after the talks um, and also at the end. Before we jump in, um, I wanted to do a, just a brief round of introductions of the people um, from our center that are gonna be speaking. And hopefully you can see their pictures. I'll start with Dr. James Berry, who's the director of the movement, uh, I mean, not the movement, sorry, of the Motor Neuron Disease uh, Division at Mass General Hospital. Thanks so much, Merritt. I'm James Berry, I'm the, um, I lead the, the um, ALS and Motor Neuron Disease Division here. And I look forward to this meeting every year. It's, it's just such an exciting time for us to kind of look back on the successes of the year and, and never a better year to do that than this one. And then Jen Scalia, who's the co-director of our ALS clinic. Hi, I'm Jen Scalia. I'm a nurse practitioner and I help lead the clinic. Um, I also have a role in research as well. So you might see me in some of the trials. And Dr. Sabrina Paganoni, who's one of our investigators in the, in the ALS Center. Hey everyone, uh, this is Sabrina Paganoni. I'm one of the physician investigators at the Healy Center and uh, I look forward to this meeting. And uh, Darlene Sawicki, who's one of our nurse practitioners. Good afternoon, I'm, uh, I'm Darlene Sawicki. I'm one of the nurse practitioners in the clinic and part of the Healy Center. Uh, and then uh, Sarah Lupino, who I'll, I'll just say uh, briefly that uh, many of you know her for a long time, but she just uh, became a nurse practitioner, but she's been in ALS for a long time. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, thanks, Merritt. I'm Sarah Lupino. Um, so I've been working as a nurse in the clinic, but will be transitioning to nurse practitioner um, very soon once they get all credentialed. And I also work as the associate site director at our research center. Thank you. And then Dr. Suma Babu was one of our investigators. Thank you, Merritt. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the symposium. I'm one of the ALS neurologists, and I look forward to this meeting. Thank you. And then Molly uh, Benson, who's uh, on the phone uh, as well, uh, who helps us uh, organize uh, uh, all our Healy Center activities. Um, so maybe just show the next slide, please, uh, Molly. And uh, this is our agenda for today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the platform trial and um, and some, some high level of where the field is. And then we have talks by uh, all the people you just met on different topics. Um, so with that, maybe um, Molly, I'll, uh, I'll share my, my screen and we'll see if this works. We've all gotten to be very good at uh, Zoom. Um, so let me know if, if uh, you can see, see this. So, you know, very, this is a, such an exciting time and, and it's, it's a good time to be able to show that there's been actually huge progress in the ALS field. Um, and uh, I'm just going to give a high level of, of why I think there's been so much progress and it's been really driven by um, the science. So uh, we understand a lot more about ALS biology now than we did even, even last year. And there's so many scientists all over the world working on this field. And it is it's a hugely collaborative field. It's one of um, the many reasons we all uh, have devoted our careers to this, our passion to find treatments for people with ALS and our commitment to doing it as fast as possible uh, on the ALS clock, as we've uh, learned from, from our patients and also um, really as a, as a global community. So this is um, a busy slide, but I just wanted to say that while a lot of the science is from understanding the genes that cause the genetic form of the illness. Um, it's very clear that there's overlaps in biology and convergence of themes and at the treatments that we um, develop in the models of the illness based on the familiar form are also very relevant and uh, for, for the sporadic, the more common form of it. And because we understand so much more of the science, we have a lot more targets to develop treatments for um, and so there are uh, drug trials all over the world now uh, attacking these different biologies, in particular um, how your body makes proteins and how they uh, clear misfolded proteins, uh, how your, your uh, motor neurons make energy, and then also ways to um, block the spread by blocking things like inflammation. 
So uh, tons of science uh, and tons of targets. And that's why it's really important that we innovate and find ways to do things faster so that we can find the best, uh, what are the most important targets and what are the most uh, important treatments. So I wanted to just highlight a few really positive news, and you're going to hear a lot more details about some of these from Dr. Uh, uh, Paganoni and Dr. Babu. So in the blue on the, on the left here are treatments that have had positive uh, uh, results in early phase studies in people with ALS. Um, and then in the red are um, treatments that are in late stage testing, what we call phase three, that meaning that if they're positive, they will be the closest to going to market. And some of the ones in blue are also um, in phase three. So uh, I'll just briefly highlight a few. So first one is a um, gene therapy for um, uh, a familial form of the illness, SOD1. You'll hear from Dr. Babu about that, but that had positive phase one, two studies. Our center was very involved in this from the start, and uh, we recently published the results of that in the New England Journal of Medicine. You'll hear from Dr. Paganoni about the recent positive results of AMX0035 a combination treatment for people with all forms of ALS. Uh, what we won't uh, have time to go over today, but what I wanted to let you know is that there's four other drugs on this list that have had positive phase two or early phase trials. Reldemptiv, uh, I'm not really sure how to pronounce that, but that's by Cytokinetics. The troponin activator had a positive phase two study and in, in is about to start a global phase three trial. Um, Ritigabine, a study done by one of our investigators, Dr. Brian Wagner, that blocks hyperexcitability that had also some positive results. This drug, though, is not on the market anymore, and, um, and there's a better version of it in development by um, Curalis as well as other companies. And this works on hyperexcitability or the excess firing of the motor neurons, so an important pathway. Methylcobalamin is a type of B12 that had a, a post hoc analysis that was positive from a study in Japan and is now in repeat study in Japan. And mesitinib is a drug that works on the inflammatory system on mast cells. That also had a positive uh, trial uh, last year and is about to, to start a phase three trial as well. So a lot of good news. And I, and I said, this is very uh, new in ALS to have so many things that are positive and it really brings a lot of hope. The so ones in red, I'll just say that aromacomol is a drug that helps your body in, uh, clear uh, misfolded proteins and aggregates better. Uh, we're waiting for the results of that phase three trial. Uh, Neuron um, is a stem cell um, a trial or drug, and, and we're also expecting those results um, by the end of this year. And Corsim is another type of stem cell that has, um, like Neuron, positive phase two data, early data, and is now in a phase three study in South Korea. Um, and then I just say that there's, a, there's over 160 companies uh, in the ALS space. And that's a lot. Um, and so um, actually in the last two days, uh, the ALS One uh, Foundation a local group that's phenomenal hosted a two day symposium uh, when we had over 300 uh, participants, all uh, largely companies to talk ALS science and, and what, what the best targets and the best treatments are and how to do it more efficiently. So I know many of you on the line have heard us talk about the platform trial, but maybe some of you haven't. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about this new initiative that we started in July. And really was, um, we were able to start this because of an amazing gift by uh, Sean Healy, his family, his friends, and the company he led, AMG, uh, to help us get this off the ground. And the idea here um, is that if you do have a big pipeline, like we do, um, that rather than test each drug on its own, is to build a platform where we test multiple drugs and we keep going until we find the cures. And we, we build the infrastructure to do it once and we don't take it down until we find the treatments that work. And so we, we've started this, it's the first one in ALS. Um, we know that this approach really significantly cuts the time to finding effective treatments in half. Uh, it cuts the cost by a third and it greatly increases the chance of, of someone with ALS getting active drug by about 67%. And uh, I wanna, before I talk a little bit more about it, I'll just say that while this uh, was really launched by that amazing first gift, we have now really brought the community together for joint funding for this uh, with amazing support by Tackle ALS, ALS Fund and Cure, the ALS Association, IMALS, and soon we'll be able to also add MDA to this list. So it's really a, the community has come together to support this. So if somebody participates in the platform trial, and we are looking for participants all over the United States, 
they get uh, randomized into one of the active treatments that is available at that time. So we started with three, say regimen A, B, and C. So you would know which one you're assigned to. Let's say you get uh, randomized to regimen A. And then there's another randomization where you're randomized either to active drug or placebo with three quarters of the participants getting the active drug and one quarter placebo for 24 weeks. And then after those 24 weeks, everybody gets access to the, the active treatment until we know the results. And the power of this approach is that when we do the analysis to see if the drug works, we take everybody on the active treatment, let's say here in the red, regimen A, we compare them to the pooled or shared placebo. And we can keep doing that going forward and keep using the shared placebo. So again, decreasing the number of people that are on placebo for those 24 weeks. So we, we started this and it's enrolling incredibly well, really thanks to the amazing patient community. The other thing you can do with these platform trials is keep learning about the illness. So in the past, when um, let's say a drug company would do their trial, you know, they enroll people, they follow them. And then at the end, if the drug didn't work, uh, all the fluid or the samples or the data really belong to the company. And sometimes they would share it and do other ALS research and sometimes they wouldn't. We, in the platform trial, you can ensure that everything we collect from people who are on the study is shared with the community. So we keep learning about the illness. We wanna develop shorter outcome measures so we can test a drug in a month or two months or three months and not need 24 weeks. So we're, we've built in a lot of these biomarkers and we're gonna keep adding them until we really find uh, you know, a, a, a even, even more efficient way than the platform trial, which is already efficient to test treatment. I do want to say that this was a really a community effort, uh, not just in the funding, but also in the buy-in and the design. From day one, we met with uh, our patient advisory group who gave us great input in the design, our investigators throughout our consortium in, the, in the North America. We met with pharma companies early on to get their interest, because if they weren't interested, uh, they have the best drugs. Uh, we, we needed their, their input too. And we met with the FDA several times and they're very much behind this and very supportive. We also brought a new initiative to this that's never been done in any platform trial, which was to use one ethics review committee called the Central IRB. And the advantage of this again is just time because we, we have heard loud and clear and we believe firmly that we need to um, knock down any barriers uh, to getting um, started. And one of the barriers in the past was that every site in the trial had to have their own hospital's ethics review. And that meant that sometimes it could take a year to get all your sites uh, through their IRBs, which again is just awful in any illness, but really awful in ALS. So we built a central IRB where there's one IRB at Mass General um, that reviews it for all of the 54 centers. That means when it's approved, it's approved everywhere, which is just fantastic. So that also saves about 12 months of time. And the last innovation I just want to highlight is that in the past, you know, if a company had a drug and they had money, they could just start that trial. There was no prioritizing of like, what are the best targets, what are the best drugs? And because we were supporting this with philanthropy, we made it a, uh, an application process for companies to be the first ones to join us. Um, and so we had a scientific committee really made of the experts in ALS pick the, uh, pick the best drugs that, uh, that we thought uh, needed to come forward. So we, we had almost 30 applications from 10 countries and we picked five. Um, and we're, now we have rolling admissions. So any company can apply. We still have a scientific review because we want every arm to be really exciting and really great drug. So I want to tell you about the four that we're uh, actually uh, uh, starting with. The fifth one will be added later this, uh, this uh, in 2021, probably in the spring. And that's just based on that company needing to do some more dose finding before ready, that was ready for the platform trial. So um, we started with three, A, B, and C. And A is uh, Zalucaplan uh, from UCB Ra, And this is a, a complement five inhibitor that blocks uh, inflammation. And we know that in people with ALS, complement levels are high and they could be destroying the muscle nerve connection and blocking that could be therapeutic. Verdipostat is the next one uh, by Biohaven. Um, and this is a myeloproxate inhibitor that blocks a different inflammation pathway in the brain. The third is CNMAU8 by Clean Nanomedicine. And this is a um, gold nanoparticle that triggers um, different reactions in the motor neurons to help create more energy and clear misfolded proteins. And the last one that we're adding right now, and we'll add it in December, is called Bridopidine by Prelenia. And this is a Sigma-1 agonist that blocks something called nuclear pore dysfunction. These are all phenomenal um, drugs. They had great preclinical science. Um, and so again, we started uh, with the first three in July 
it took nine days to add Polenia from our IRB. So again, I just want to stress that the efficiency of, of this uh, approach is that when you add a new drug, you're just amending the protocol and you're just reviewing the risks of that new drug. You're not reviewing the whole uh, platform again and you're not um, rebuilding any infrastructure. And uh, that's really just phenomenal. Um, so I'll just say that uh, as of uh, Thursday, and it could be more now, uh, there are 156 people throughout the United States that have, have uh, enrolled in, in the platform trial. Um, each arm is 160. So we're looking for about 600 people for the first uh, four drugs. Um, there's, I'd say in the past, before this, when people were enrolling in trials, there would be a half to one person per uh, hospital per month enrolling in trials, which was actually pretty slow. It's not uh, unusual compared to other illnesses, um, but we really felt that that was too slow. And that we're, we're seeing in this trial, I think because it was designed with input from patients, it's so patient-centered, it's enrolling about 4,400 times faster, you know, three to four participants per site per month. And if it keeps at this rate, we think we'll be done enrolling these first four drugs in February or March and then have results, you know, uh, next summer or early fall, which again, will have results of four drugs, not one. And again, that's the advantage of this type of approach. Um, we do have a patient navigator who recently started, uh, Kathleen Small. Um, and uh, Alison Bulaz, who I'm sure many of you know, who's a very um, powerful and effective uh, patient advocate. They're here to help people find the site next to you, answer questions about the platform trial. And this is how uh, you can reach them by phone, uh, by email. And again, we'll have these slides and the recording up on our website as well. So I just wanna uh, say one thing about um, the impact of philanthropy. We, we uh, couldn't have done any of this without the amazing gift uh, to, from the, the Sean Healy, his friends and AMG and so many other people. It really uh, speeds up um, the science. It can take sometimes, if you write a grant with state of the government, it can take you know, 12 to 18 months from the time you write it to when you actually get funding. And that's way too slow for uh, ALS. And also it tends to have to be very conservative projects. So philanthropy lets us take uh, risks and move much faster. Our kind of areas that we want to grow this year, we want to keep adding more drugs to the platform trial. We want to expand perhaps to Canada or other countries. Uh, we want to provide a parallel uh, compassionate use program for anyone uh, who might not be able to be in the platform trial or other trials. We want to keep growing our ALS house call program and our telehealth program so we can help people wherever they are. And then we, with our science advisory committee, which is a really a global committee that meets regularly, uh, we want to tackle the biggest barriers to finding cures, and, and those are these big categories. Like, we want to figure out how do you stop progression? How do you repair and regrow the motor neurons and the connections to the muscles? And then once we've solved those, how do you stop this from ever starting? These are big problems, and we're not going to solve them alone, but we have the ability and the team to build teams, build global teams to solve these big problems, and that's our goal for, for uh, the next uh, year. So with that, um, I'm going to pass the, the Zoom baton uh, to, I think, Dr. Barry, um, so we can go to the next presentation. James, you might be muted. Okay, I think you can hear me and soon you'll hopefully see my slides here. So um, thank you so much, Merritt, for, um, for, for starting us off on such a high note. The, the Healy platform trial really is changing the way we do things. We've had remarkable progress in, in 2020. It's, it's, I think, overall a very unusual year, but it's been a remarkable year for, for ALS. We've had compelling positive ALS trial results, the, the start of the Healy platform trial, really transformations in how we design ALS trials, spurred on by COVID, to be honest. but, but but with enduring changes that I think will make things better. And I'll talk about a, a little bit of that. And, and also retooling our ALS clinical care in a similar way is, is I think gonna, gonna, gonna really be a growth here for, for going forward. Um, Sabrina Paganoni will talk about the, the positive results of the AMX 035 trial. Some people know it as the Centaur trial. In short, there was a 25% slowing of ALS, of, of ALS progression uh, judged by the questionnaire called the ALSF4SR. 
Um, and a follow-up study then showed a six-month survival benefit in people who had been first randomized to the drug rather than placebo. Really remarkable to have results like this, and we're incredibly excited to be able to report on that in spring, and we'll talk about it in more detail, as I said. We've also seen this year um, that we've been able to share results from gene therapy for SOV1 ALS, which is a genetic form of ALS. And SOV1 turns into a toxic protein in, in, in this form of the disease. Um, what, you, what you're seeing here is what we call a gel. That is, uh, we run a protein across what looks like jello in a way, and we run it in lanes. And you can see these lanes numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And, and in numbers 2 through 11, there's a black band there, and that black band it represents the SOD1 protein. And you can see that in patient 1, we don't see that protein, and the, we don't see as much of that band. And the reason that, we've, that we don't see that band is we've been able to reduce the protein by using a gene therapy that's packaged in a virus and delivered into the spinal fluid. Really, I think a remarkable proof of concept and paves the way for us to, to uh, move on to larger gene therapy trials uh, in ALS. Uh, Sabri, uh, pardon me, Suma will we'll talk later about the phase one, two trial of, of an antisense oligonucleotide called tofersin, another way to attack this toxic protein uh, in SOD1 ALS. And, and you can see here um, on the left side that tofersin at low doses uh, didn't have much effect, or and placebo didn't have much effect on the level of, of SOD1. But in orange, you can see that line declining over time. And that is. Um, uh, oh, goodness, let's see. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to pause for just a minute. Um, somebody, somebody gave a comment that my, that my uh, sharing is minimized and they're seeing only me. I want to make sure that's not something more broad. Um, could maybe one of the other panelists comment here? Okay. So, so um, it may be that you need to, if, if that's the case, you may need to um, change your view on, on, uh, on Zoom. I uh, apologize for that interruption. Uh, I, I, I do want to be sure that people can, can see. I could add, James, the view options might be in the top right-hand corner of Zoom. Sometimes Great. there's a grid version or different versions. So that might be what will help. Great. Yeah, there are a couple of people who, who are uh, who are having this, this same kind of comment that my image is large and the slide is small. Um, so I think if you if you uh, change the view from I think what's called a spotlight view, you should you should see all of us kind of along the side and, and the slide is large. Um, all right. So uh, apologies for the for the interruption. Um, we we see um, in orange uh, on on this slide that, that you see a reduction in SOD one, the toxic protein at the highest dose, which is really exciting. We also see when we look, turn our attention to clinical that the ALS FRSR stays essentially flat across this time while, it, while, while those that did not get the high dose or got a placebo had a reduction in ALS FRSR, suggesting maybe a clinical benefit, which is exciting. Brainstorm cell therapeutics phase three trial. I know a lot of people have their eyes on this one. There, there are nu numerous trials that are finishing actually, or Makwamal will be finishing and reading out soon. Uh, this one, at this brainstorm cell therapeutics uh, trial had 200 participants. Um, final tre treatments were completed in 2020, and we're expecting data from that to come soon, certainly before the end of the year. Uh, I think we're all really, really excited for yet another really exciting trial to, to, to read out. Merritt talked about the, the platform trial. I want to just, just sort of take a moment to pause uh, uh, on what she said and say that this was really visionary to bring together patients, sponsors, philanthropists, um, industry, um, and, and site uh, investigators in a way that, that I think created something that's special, really special and different for, for our whole community. Um, and uh, she, she showed this slide with uh, 54 trial sites and one central IRB. I think the point I wanna, I wanna just highlight here is that with this vision, um, we are reaching people across the country and hopefully hopefully now uh, soon internationally with the opportunity to really change how they interact with this disease and, and allow them to have the most cutting edge therapies uh, accessed near them, wherever they, they live. 
Now, um, there are other innovations that we're bringing to, to trials as well. Um, the, um, one, one of the big innovations, I think, is in biomarkers. These are sort of signposts that we can use. They're, they're markers um, that tell us something about ALS, its onset, or its progression. Um, and, and I'll first talk a little bit about uh, blood or spinal fluid biomarkers. And we're looking often in blood or spinal fluid for proteins. And these proteins can kind of light the way in, in clinical trials. One that has really turned the corner for us, and we've been working on it for many years, oh, but it's not James, been- James, can I interrupt you so, just a second? Sorry. You just in the Q&A, there's a couple comments about your slides not looking small. Yeah, they look okay for me, but I, I'm just wondering if, if that's still going on, whether we want to try again, I guess. Different here. Let's see. Um, I can change the way that I share. Let me, let me change the way I'm sharing these. And I may need a little help from you guys here. Um, what do you see now? It looks good for me. I, I, uh, but it's maybe good for me too. It looks the same. The people who um, wrote in, if tell us if it looks okay. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but I wanted to. No, no, I, I, yeah, no, I, I agree. It's worth interrupting because we do want to make sure. I, I did change something about the way that I that I was sharing, um, and so I, if, if anybody sees a difference. Um, a few people said it was good now, so okay. I think what you did worked. Oh, good, perfect. Thank you. Apologies about that for for those who. Uh, okay, yeah, good. Um, so neurofilament is a, a protein. That, that we have seen over years has been higher in people with ALS, and it's especially higher in those with faster progression. So it may, it may correlate with progression. What you see here is both side-by-side -side spinal fluid and blood. Uh, the gray dots are controls, that is people who don't have ALS. Um, and you see low, lowish levels of, of neurofilament. Um, in yellow, you see people who have slow progression. In red, you see people with faster progression, and they have a higher level of of neurofilament. And then in orange, there's sort of an intermediate group, and they have sort of an intermediate uh, level of, of neurofilament. And we are now beginning to use this uh, in, uh, in trials and guide the way to potentially doing faster trials. We're also looking at imaging biomarkers, and this allows us to view ALS in the brain. Suma Babu is leading a lot of these efforts. And um, in short, I think, you know, you don't need to be a neuroradiologist to see here where um, we're highlighting changes uh, in people with ALS. And, and I'll tell you that this yellow and red um, area is the motor cortex, exactly where we would expect to see um, changes in people with ALS. And being able to visualize a, a disease like this can really change the way that we interact with it in clinical trials and drive things faster. We've seen that in diseases like uh, multiple sclerosis. We're also working on digital biomarkers, which bring us more data at a lower burden to those who are participating in studies. So we've done things like use uh, an app on a cell phone to record speech recordings and then analyze how much pausing people do in their speech. And we can see that in people with ALS, there are longer pauses uh, in speech time. And not only that, but th that pause time goes up over time. You can see those dashed lines, each one being one participant, those dashed lines are going up in everybody except for one, one person, actually. We could follow that over time, and if we can change that trajectory, it could be an outcome measure for, for a trial. And this is all done at home. We also are looking at using the ALS FRSR, not in clinic, but rather as a self-entry uh, questionnaire on mobile phones or tablets. And we can see that that correlates well. So on the, on the bottom axis is the self-entry score, and on the vertical axis, you can see the standard administered score and they correlate quite well. They're not exactly the same, and we're working out some of these details. We have to understand our tool, but this could give us many, many more questionnaires for our trials and give us more power to detect, detect change faster. We're also using mobile phone to look at a GPS signal from a study, study application. And what we found um, was that we had, a, we had about eight or 10 people who were using uh, this, this study app right around the time of COVID. And in, in those people that we were studying, they were spending about, about 19 hours a day at home prior to COVID. 
And after COVID, it went up to almost 24 hours a day that people were spending at home. In fact, really, there was one participant who was leaving home for any substantial amount of time. And we can characterize and quantify that change. Now, many people on the call, I think most of us are probably saying, yeah, we understand it. We know that this doesn't tell us anything new, but it quantifies it. And that is the difference between knowing something and being able to prove it. And that, I think, is the really, really key point of, of this slide. Just to, just to give you a sense, um, in the general population, people went from spending about 10 hours a day at home up to 14 hours a day at home um, after COVID. So similar degree of change, but really different picture. Again, quantifying what I think we all know on the call. We're using these tools to build COVID-proof research and it's going to be better than ever really going forward because using these tools we can design trials that are faster that reduce burden that that allow us to do remote visits and actually we've been able to look back at trials and say you know what some of these visits are unnecessary and we can make this trial uh, even more convenient than ever and get the same amount of information that we ever have at the same time we've we've really been working to expand um the 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 um to expand the um, way that we can get access to, to people with ALS um, experimental medications. So in addition to trials, we now are, 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 are conducting expanded access programs, uh, which are aimed at people who wouldn't qualify for trials, but are in many cases using the same drugs. And we can still look at safety of these drugs and to some extent efficacy. Uh, but the main idea here is to really give hope to people who might not qualify for a trial. This is a, a big uh, effort at our center, and, and we look forward to expanding this even more. As I said in the beginning, we've also been building COVID resilient clinical care, and that will be better than ever because we're, we're addressing problems that have always been there, and we're, we're finding ways to deliver innovative care. Um, the ALS House Call program, which preceded COVID, but really has become a, an important uh, a, a critical part of how we deliver care now. It's really there to bring expert, integrated, timely, responsive, and targeted care to people with ALS beyond the walls of our clinic and to reduce medical isolation. We know that medical isolation um, leads to worse outcomes, not just in ALS, but, but in really all neurologic disorders. And so we've been incredibly excited to have this house call program. Um, Deb Skanecki and Kristen Kingsley are actually um, out on the road um, seeing patients in, in the eastern part of Massachusetts and Myra Alvarado has been um, sort of organizing this and scheduling patients with them and a key part of this program as well. Um, we've also been relying on telemedicine more than ever. It's gone from sort of a niche program that we started in 2011 um, and, and saw a few patients that way. By 2016, we were really extending that reach across the U.S. and seeing people both locally and as well as across the country. Um, but at a, at a, you know, at a fairly slow rate, maybe 100 patients over, over the period of the year. As we all know, in 2020, video televisits have become very commonplace. And we've seen where those video televisits are incredibly successful. And we've also seen uh, places that we can innovate more and, and, and really expand what we can do from home. So things like connected spirometers to get vital capacity at home, connected scales so we can keep an eye on weight, um, and, and even uh, home lab draws will allow us to stay connected. But no matter what technology we bring to this, um, really connection and, and caring are at the heart of what we wanna do. And so the ALS Parenting at a Challenging Time program, I think, is one to highlight. This is something that we've been able to bring into our clinic with a, 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 a donation from a foundation. Um, and and Archana Basu, Cynthia Moore, and Paula Rausch have really led the way in an educational program that supports people with ALS um, who have children and their co-parents as they confront all of the questions that, that, um, that come up in that situation. We're incredibly grateful to, to, to have this and we really are, are looking forward to expanding it even more. And finally, um, you know, Merritt mentioned this as well, but we'd like to move toward ALS prevention. It would be wonderful to have a cure. We would also love to understand how to head this disease off Katie Nicholson has been uh, running the dominantly inherited ALS study in conjunction with Tim Miller at, at WashU. Uh, we've been, she's in, enrolled uh, around 100 people into this study who are asymptomatic but come from a family where the, a, a, an ALS gene has been found. Um, and she's been doing things like collecting blood for biomarkers, but also what we're showing here is 
uh, looking at speech biomarkers in people who are asymptomatic and, and others who, who have gone on to develop ALS. I think it's really exciting to characterize this and be able to think ahead to a day where we can get ahead of this disease um, and prevent people from getting it. Really exciting. Um, I just want to say that our clinic has um, continued to run because of the, the, the real dedication of the nurses, the allied health providers, the nurse practitioners. Many people in clinic are, are seeing uh, just, a, just a portion of what we, what we used to be able to bring in and show from our multidisciplinary team. But I can assure you that behind the scenes, we are all working very closely together, communicating about you and hopefully reaching out to you. If you have questions about um, you know, allied health providers, PT, PACT, um, other parts of our team, feel free to reach out to your providers at any time with questions. And finally, I would just, I would just underline that philanthropy drives innovation. It, it underlies sort of many of the things that, that we are able to do both in clinic and in research, just as Merit highlighted at the end of her talk. I'm gonna pass off now to uh, Jen Scalia and Sarah Lupino to talk a little bit about um, ALS in the time of COVID and, and how to best uh, help us support you and support yourself. Great, thanks, James. Uh, James, did you want to take any questions in between? I, bet, I think there might be a few. Um, oh, you uh, want to wait? I, I thought we might wait, um, uh, but if there are a couple of questions, maybe while, Sarah, while you get your slides up, we, we can yeah. read those. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Um, so one question, can, parents, can, can patients with um, progressive bulbar palsy participate in the Healy platform trial? If not, is there another path for people with PVP to test for dopamine? Mary, do you want to do you want to take that? Uh, so, so yes. So, so people who have onset in the um, bowler muscles are uh, would probably be eligible. Um, the, the criteria we use are something called an Elascorio criteria. Um, so we we could get more details in, uh, from your records, but there's nothing that excludes somebody like that from the the platform file. Right. Yeah. The the it's often often comes down to some of the details and and. Um, uh, and then I think it's really important to continue to be in touch with us, even if it, even if that doesn't work. There's another question about sort of access to trials, and um, you know, there there are other options um, to to try um, to try to get access to either experimental medications or or um, medications that 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 you know are, are unproven but but may have. A, Maybe so, I'll just add, like, I didn't really talk too much about the expanded access program, but we are asking every company that works with us on the platform trial to provide um, drug for expanded access, and they have um, all agreed. And so we're working through that. Um, there's small numbers, but there, there's, it's still um, so that for people who might not be eligible, there will eventually be expanded access for dopamine too. Um, so, and, and we've, we've been doing some fundraising around that, and, with, um, and I think we're going to be able to start in the new year. Yeah, I think you know we, we saw those numbers going up and up just at our center. I think there's a big push nationally to have multi-center um, expanded access programs, and you know this is somewhere this, this is a place where I think as a community we've really come together to try to try to change the way that we do things because of exactly these kinds of questions. Um, uh, another great question is: Is anyone collecting national data on COVID outcomes in, in people with ALS? I, I have to admit that I. Um, We'll ask some friends at the CDC who work in the National Registry about this, but I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Do any of the other panelists know of an active effort? I know they've done this in Europe, in Italy in particular. Um, they were not finding an increased risk, um, but I have not heard of a US plan. I think that, but we can find fact, out. I think, I think they saw, in fact, a sort of a low transmission rate in, in Italy, and probably, uh, you know, Perhaps that comes back to some of that quantifiable data to say, you know, people with ALS are often staying at home, but it's a, it's a really good question. And we do work a lot with the CDC. Uh, last one, and then I think we'll, we'll go on to Sarah and Jen. Um, does the home care reach out, um, including dentists, podiatrists, GP, and other healthcare providers? Really good question. Um, our, our house call providers are, are really sort of embedded within our clinic and don't include um, those other specialties. However, we are more than happy to uh, work with you to try to find providers that might either come to your home or be more accessible um, than typical providers. And, and we do that a lot. So I would very much encourage you to reach out to your care team and, and we're 
are happy to work with you. Um, okay, we will get to some of the other questions, but I think we should go on to, to, um, to Sarah and Jen. So. Sure, so I'm gonna start. Um, please know that Sarah has the slides from her computer, so there may be a little bit of coordination. Bear with us. Um, but we're really happy to talk to you today about about living um, in the time of COVID with ALS and how that affects your care and, and you. And we want to let you know what we're doing for delivering care during COVID. What's changed, what's the same? There are some things that are the same. And also just to take a moment to reflect and provide tips um, about things to keep in mind, especially going into the winter months where we see the COVID uh, numbers starting to rise a bit. Um, but just to, if you take nothing else away from our talk, we are still here and we are wanting to help. Um, we are here and dedicated on the clinic and on the research front. Uh, we are sometimes more remote than, than in person, but we are completely committed to helping uh, you with whatever issues that come your way. So in terms of clinic, uh, this the clinic care is the biggest change. And as many of you know, we are moving to a lot of virtual visits. Uh, we don't want to get rid of in-person visits. We love seeing you. And we are now starting to have more physical therapy and speech pathology in our actual clinic. So uh, virtual visits are definitely not to replace in-person, but we have been able to touch base with people a lot more by video, which is more convenient and has allowed for a lot more touch points. We have a lot more video visits, um, virtual visits available. And as Dr. Barry mentioned in his presentation, we've been doing virtual visits since before COVID. So this is something that, you know, while there were some technology changes, we largely knew how to do uh, and were, uh, were familiar and comfortable with. I would like to also mention that in the video visits, if you have family members that want to join, that would typically join you to clinic and they're not with you in your home, we can also invite them into the virtual visits. So this is really to help be accessible to you for clinical care for you and your family. Uh, when you do come into the clinic, because we do want to still see you, there are a lot of policies that have changed. This is all to keep you safe. This really has, um, the whole Mass General uh, system has really focused on keeping patients in the center and making sure that all of our policies are really geared towards keeping you safe. Uh, I will admit that does mean that there are some changes we ask of you as well. So, for instance, the universal mask policy, we do ask everybody who comes into the hospital to be wearing a hospital grade mask that we will give to you. Um, and there are lots of Purell stations and uh, hand sanitizer as you come in. They're doing testing um, on any patient who needs a, a procedure. So uh, that's across the board, not just ALS. So if you know that you're going to have a planned procedure, they are testing patients before they come in so that they can make sure that anybody who may be asymptomatic or, or with symptoms uh, that we're caring for everyone appropriately to keep everybody else in the hospital safe. These policies are ever changing as we are learning more about COVID and how to best keep you safe. So we will always keep you up to date. You can always ask questions. And there are many signs throughout the hospital when you come in to let you know what the most up-to-date policies are uh, so that you can adhere to them and that the people around you are adhering to them so that you can stay as safe as possible. So what does clinic <laughs> look these days? So uh, we went to clinic this week during the middle of the day to show you what our clinic is looking like because it does look similar but a bit different. Uh, you can see that there's, this is the check-in desk um, for those of you who have not been to our clinic before. And you can see that there are some chairs in front of it. That's to help keep distance between you and the person checking you in. And this is actually what our waiting room looks like in the middle of the day, which is very different than pre-COVID that used to have a lot of people here. Um, and we ha there's a lot going on in terms of making sure you get into a room right away. Every provider who sees patients in clinic has a pod, which is two rooms. 
And the purpose of this pod is to help make sure that when you come into clinic that we can put you into a room as soon as humanly possible. And so here are the rooms. When you go into a room, um, there are arrows so that there's no cro people crossing pathways in the hallway. There's an entrance kind of wing and an exit wing. Um, but each provider does have two pods so that when someone comes in, you get roomed right away, you see your provider. And then when you leave, we clean down the room completely and leave it, let it set for 10 minutes before anyone else is able to come in. So with this setup, we are really able to keep your, the room clean and people out of the waiting room um, so that you're not, uh, it's not as difficult to maintain socially distant, uh, distance in the waiting room. If you mind, don't mind going back one slide, there to the, um, waiting room photo. Yep. And you can also see in the chairs in the waiting room, there are reminders of don't sit here so that if people are sitting in these chairs that you are maintaining a distance from people that you don't know. Uh, and uh, th that's been in place. Virtual visits have also been great in helping keep down the, the amount, of, amount of people that need to come in. And because of that, we are also able to see patients safely um, when, when it is your turn to come in. I should also mention that actually there's lobby checkpoints too. So even before you get into our waiting room, you have to check in in the front of the hospital where they make sure that you're not having any symptoms. You have to um, say that you don't have any symptoms of COVID, no sore throat, new cough, um, shortness of breath and the whole thing. So there is also that checkpoint before you even get this far to make sure that you're safe and you will also get a phone call before your visit, um, double checking to make sure those things. So we're really doing everything we can to make sure that anybody who might have a symptom, that their visit gets rescheduled to a different time or moved to a virtual visit so that uh, we can best help them while keeping everybody else safe. I should also mention, since we just talked about check-in, there's actually no check-out either. So there's no line to check out and schedule your next appointment. We will do that afterwards um, with following up remotely. In clinic also, while we are starting to bring physical therapy and speech and swallowing into the clinic, uh, there, the other uh, teams, the Parenting in a Challenging Time team, palliative care, social work, um, every, uh, genetic counselor, respiratory, everybody else that you might typically see in our clinic are all following up remotely. So they are not in the clinic and that helps reduce uh, not only the length of time that you're in clinic, but the number of people in clinic. We've actually been hearing from a number of people that they've, been, they've liked splitting up their time because sometimes our clinic days can be long days. So having two separate days um, can help, help uh, process all the information that, that's going on. But please, please, please let us know feedback throughout this process because it is ever changing and we wanna know what we can do to help make sure that you feel safe. If you don't feel safe, we want to know. Um, and we want to also make sure that we are giving you all of the care that you need for ALS in the, in the meantime. And then the, uh, the big what's the same is we are still here. We might have masks on, we might have um, goggles on or fancy glasses that fog up every time we breathe, but we are still here um, and we wanna help. Our clinical approach is exactly the same with putting patients in the center of every thought process that we have. Uh, we want to find better answers, more answers in research, and there's still that integration between clinical and research. Um, we are completely committed to you and your family, which is why we are always looking for feedback and what we can do better um, while keeping everyone safe. Thanks, Jen. I'm just going to touch a little bit on some of the safe practices that are being implemented on our end um, by employees and staff at Mass General Hospital within our own community. Um, so these several pictures represent a lot of the new policies and practices that have been implemented over the last several months. You can see that the empty waiting room strategy um, flows across all of the ambulatory care centers at Mass General. So many clinics are following a similar model. Um, in terms of the universal mask policy, that definitely applies to us as uh, nurses, physicians, you know, specialized care team, um, so that when we are having to work in spaces like elevators or hallways within six feet of each other, we're staying safe. We're also minimizing density within our own internal meetings and conference rooms. Um, we can only have a minimum number of people in a given space um, just to keep everybody safe. 
And there's also many new um, strategies coming out for keeping employees safe and, and any visitors or patients um, for eating and drinking. So there are now designated dining areas for both patients and staff throughout the hospital and special dedicated employee break rooms so that if we do have to take off our mask to eat or drink, we're doing it in a way that's safe and that's um, specifically distance. And then um, I just love these flowers that went out on the bullfinch lawn a few months ago. Um, again, everybody masks, but we're still trying to implement as much as we can, you know, different events, either virtually or on site, where we can come together as a community um, and still be able to achieve you know, our mission at Mass General. So these are some examples of uh, some additional signage that we definitely see day to day and you may see as well when you're navigating in and out of the hospital. Um, again, very strict about eating and drinking. Um, there's special procedures for how you're supposed to safely take on a mask, take put on a mask and take it off. Uh, constant reminders about hand hygiene when we're going in and out of patient rooms or even just from space to space. I also wanted to note that uh, we're all required, any staff member that's going on campus at Mass General and across the Mass General Brigham hospitals are required to complete what's called a COVID pass. So before we're able to enter our unit before every single shift, we have to complete an online questionnaire attesting that we haven't had any symptoms that could be COVID related. If we do, we're told to stay home and call the occupational health for next steps. Um, and if we are clear to go into work, we're all set to, to enter. And they're actually tracking this um, by the way that we access by tapping our badges on different units. So we do get flagged um, and it does get escalated all the way up to leadership and management if it needs to, to ensure that we're all being held accountable for um, doing our symptom attestation. Our COVID testing practices at Mass General are, are growing leaps and bounds. Um, we continue to have drive up testing centers that are open throughout the Mass General um, campus and ancillary campuses across the, the region. There's um, also testing centers offered through the Department of Public Health. So if you go on either the MGH or DPH websites, there'll be a comprehensive list of testing centers. So if you do need to get tested, um, it's easily accessible. Um, the hospital is also rolling out new home testing options, which we've started to explore as a clinic, which is great for patients who may need to get tested but are having difficulty getting out of the house. And then I wanted to just take a moment to get on my soapbox really quick about flu shots and just remind everybody that we should all be making sure to get a flu shot this season. It's so important now more than ever to, to do so. And in the hospital, employees are uh, now mandated to have a flu vaccination, um, pretty much no excuses whatsoever. So if you have any questions about that, some people do, please don't hesitate to reach out to your ALS provider or one of the nurses and we're happy to help you get access to one and talk that through. And then just switching gears a little bit, um, I, I really like this diagram. It was uh, shown to me by a colleague at the beginning of the pandemic and it, it kind of held it with me th throughout the last several months. Um, and I think it does a great job of essentially naming and validating the fact that we are all both as care providers, as people, as family members, and with, with our patients too, going through a challenging time. Um, and, this diagram is geared more towards the pandemic response, but I think there's a lot of overlap with people who are navigating a chronic illness like ALS and our patients are doing both of those things at the same time. So it's, there's different stages that we all go through and you know, survival, acceptance, growth stages. And it's important to note that I think in a given day, we might be going through one or all of the stages at the same time, day to day, hour to hour. Um, so it helps to identify where we're at on a given day, maybe name that or tell each other so that we can give each other that extra support and, and lend a hand. And just also noting that it's totally normal to move back and forth between these st stages and we're absolutely not alone and we're here for you through, throughout all of this. So we wanted to outline just some quick self-care tips and ways that you can support yourself and each other and your family at home, um, especially going into the winter months where things might get a little bit more quiet and cold outside. So there's several resources. We took a look um, at our Mass General website alone. And if you just do a quick Google search like MGH, COVID-19 coping or MGH COVID mental health, our psychiatry department especially has listed a really comprehensive website with links to YouTube videos, iPhone apps on wellness, mindful meditation practices, um, referrals out, helplines, counseling call centers. There's so many great things that are really at our fingertips and everything's being moved to you know, online virtual access. 
Um, so some of the tips that we pulled from there that we really liked um, are kind of straightforward, simple things, but just good to keep in mind that anything we can do to strengthen our self-care, healthy lifestyle practices like sleep hygiene, exercise, relaxation, I know it's difficult, especially this week, to limit excessive information intake, especially on social media, um, but sometimes it's important to know when to kind of turn things off and decompress. Um, continuing to stay connected with loved ones virtually, relying on reputable sources of information, whether that be about COVID-19 or about ALS research. Um, and it, we always say that we're happy to communicate with you and let you know what our thoughts are on the most reputable resources for information. Um, and we'll try to relay in any information that we have through webinars and website updates, um, establishing care routines, learning and intellectual engagement with each other, taking an opportunity to try something new or learn something different during this time, and always trying to lead with kindness to overcome any anxiety or stress that we may be feeling. So lastly, just um, how to stay connected with us. The Two great resources to stay connected to our clinic are, is first our MGH ALS clinic website. Um, this is where you can find direct contact information about all of the ALS clinic providers and care team, updates on our research and clinical trials. We post a lot of webinars, um, lists of trials that are currently actively recruiting, uh, updates on our platform trial and different news and events like this symposium. Um, and then we also want to encourage people, especially now, to, to really make sure that you sign up for Patient Gateway. It's such an important tool. Um, for you to be able to have direct communication with the whole ALS care team and to be able to access information like quick view of medical records, lab results, um, schedule and reschedule appointments. I believe you can also access virtual visits through Patient Gateway. Um, and then it's important to note that any messages that you send to your provider or ALS care team um, go into kind of a pool so that there's always somebody cross-checking every message that comes through so that if somebody, a provider is out of the office or out sick on a given day, there's always, always somebody through Gateway who's going to be able to see your message and help respond. And I think that's the end of our presentation. So thank you all very much for attending. And um, I think we might have another break or Q&A session. So have yeah, so I think, um, <clears throat> Sarah, we're, that, was, that was wonderful. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think we're running a, a little bit behind it. I think it's reasonable for us to maybe do a, a few minutes of questions. We have a couple of people with uh, raised hands and, and a couple of written questions. And then we may, just to get back on track, uh, go straight into the second part of the program. Um, we hope that people feel, feel comfortable sort of uh, stretching in front of the screen here. Um, I want to, uh, I, I may need some help calling on the raised hands here. Um, Mimi, let me see if I can. James, Mimi had a question on um, televisits for new patients. Oh yes, thank you, yeah. Great, so um, great question. Uh, the answer is yes, we, we do sometimes do new uh, patient visits through telemedicine in, in this time of COVID. Prior to that, and, and remains uncertain, maybe after that, um, it's a little more, more challenging because of some of the regulations. Um, there are still, there's, there's still some particulars. So um, absolutely reach out to us. We're, we're really happy to make it work if, if we at all can. Another question was um, from William, uh, can lower motor neuron uh, somebody with lower motor neuron only, do they qualify for the platform trial? I can answer that one. So if, if, um, if, you, if someone's never had any upper motor neuron signs, then, then no, they wouldn't be able to qualify for this one. But there are other trials that someone might be able to qualify for. If someone's had upper motor neuron signs in the past and they've gone, then someone would be eligible. So it's, that's, it's a little tricky and um, that's definitely worth talking to um, your neurologist about. Um, to see if there's any upper motor neuron signs. And I see a raised hand from um, Mirna, and I don't, just don't know how to unmute. Um, Molly, if you know that, that would be great. Or Mirna, if you could type your question into the Q&A or have someone help you with that, that would be, that would be great. Uh, we'll work on trying to apologize for this. Every time I think I know how this Zoom program works, I've proven wrong twice this time. Uh, um, 
While we're doing that, um, Jen and Sarah, you know, um, to set up a virtual visit for the patients, it's the same process, contacting us through Patient Gateway or contacting the clinic, correct? That's correct, yes. Uh, once you, to set it up, you can call us or through Patient Gateway. They will send you instructions on how to do this. Um, I believe it's through Patient Gateway actually that you have to log in for your virtual visit and then there's a, something to click on once you're in there. So it really is all in that one Patient Gateway platform. And we're happy to do them. We've been doing them a lot. and We understand that it's, it's a tough time to travel. Good. M maybe, Marina, if you could type in your question then we can answer the next uh, Q&A. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Let, let's, I think, it, um, so I th otherwise I think we've answered kind of the questions that, that we have. So this is, I think, the, the perfect time to, to move along. Um, uh, and uh, Sabrina Paganoni, uh, the lead of the, lead, lead investigator for the Amelix trial of AMX0035, which has already been referenced a couple of times and is, is um, exciting for all of us to hear about, is gonna talk next. Great, thank you, James. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I'm, I cannot use uh, Zoom today either. Uh, can you see the slides now? Yes. Is that okay? Okay. Yes. Just... And, uh, if if anyone has um, problems, with, you know, please put it into the comment the Q and A box. Sorry. All right. Finally, okay. Uh, thank you, James, for um, for the opportunity to present the results of the center trial, a trial of AMX 35 for ALS. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to share these results. I want to start by saying that the center trial uh, truly is a collaboration in the ALS community and every speaker uh, today and so many more people from our center and collaborating centers have been working on this trial um, for, for quite some time now. Uh, so the trial was, uh, was uh, designed and conducted in partnership between um, academia and industry. And by industry, I mean Amelix Pharmaceuticals, uh, which is a phenomenal um, pharmaceutical company that started, you know, it's a young company that started a few years ago with real commitment to neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, they actually developed uh, their product for Alzheimer's disease initially. And what you may not know is that the reason they went into ALS is because of, of meetings at Mass General that happened around 2015 or so when they met with Mary Sukovic, uh, as well as Rudy Tanzi. Uh, Rudy Tanzi is a professor at our institution, is, is an expert in Alzheimer's. And so they initially reached out to him to start a program in Alzheimer's disease. And then through Rudy, they met Merit, who actually saw the um, opportunity for uh, a real impact in ALS. And so because of that, they decided to, to start with an ALS trial, which is fantastic and really a great example of how uh, really uh, the scientific community can come together to make new things happen. Um, and you know whether it's Alzheimer's or ALS, we're all collaborating. In fact, there is an ongoing trial for Alzheimer's for the same compound. But the ALS trial uh, went faster, which is great. And, and so at the time in 2015, Merit introduced me to uh, the people from Amelix and together with Merit, uh, James, Nazem, other uh, uh, faculty at MGH at the time, uh, we designed the trial, applied for a, a grant to, uh, to uh, fund part of the program. There was a grant that was given um, by the ALS Association and ALS Finding a Cure. ALS Finding a Cure also uh, funded additional uh, toxicology work and lab work that really made uh, this trial possible. So, uh, so together again with this great collaboration, we were able to, um, to fast track this trial and started uh, start enrolling participants in 2017. Participants were enrolled at 25 sites of the NEALS consortium. Uh, we also enrolled participants at MGH. Uh, Dr. James Berry was the CIPI uh, and our nurses on the call uh, and other faculty on the call and, and, uh, and other colleagues um, helped um, enroll uh, a good group of patients uh, at MGH. And in addition, the other uh, participants were enrolled at the other sites that you can see on the screen. So again, great collaboration uh, within the community that made this trial possible. So the trial center uh, was a trial of AMX 35. AMX35 is a combination of the compounds uh, sodium phenylbutyrate or PB and torosodiol or terso. 
So each of them targets different cell components. Uh, so the goal here is to keep the nerve cells functioning properly. They were known individually as individual agents, and they had been tested before in lab models uh, individually, uh, in different models of neurodegenerative diseases, including ALS, and they had shown uh, neuroprotective properties. And then uh, what Avalix did was to combine both. Uh, and by combining both, they found that uh, the, the effect was even greater in the lab. Of note, uh, each individual compound had already been uh, considered for ALS. Uh, in fact, Dr. Sukovic had uh, run a, a trial of PB in people with ALS. That was a small trial uh, showing uh, safety uh, and target engagement of PB, uh, but the, there wasn't a follow-up. And so then the company uh, decided to combine it with Terso uh, because the combination uh, was found to be even more effective in the lab. And so they created this combined product known as AMX35 that comes as a powder. The powder is dissolved in water and can be given either by mouth or via feeding tube. Uh, and uh, we generally recommend to, in the trial, we decided to, uh, to uh, start with once a day for three weeks and then to, um, to titrate up to twice a day uh, if well tolerated. Um, and so we used so the drug and matching placebo in the trial. So the central trial again was a trial of uh, testing the combination of phenylbutyrate and, and terso uh, also known as AMX35, and we reported the results very recently. So this is really um, uh, recent news, uh, and, and we're so excited about it. So in September, we reported the results of the drug on physical function and safety. Uh, and then in October, we reported the uh, results on survival. So today I'm gonna briefly summarize the, the results of, of these two papers uh, that basically summarize the main findings of the trial. And we also gave previous webinars that uh, have been recorded. So, um, you know, we can share the links that they are on the NEOS website. You can uh, see more news also on our website at the Healy Center. So the, the trial was made possible thanks to uh, 137 participants with ALS who enrolled in the trial. Uh, average age at the beginning of the trial was 57. Uh, they were about one year after their initial symptoms from ALS, uh, and they were about six months since their diagnosis. About a quarter of them had bulbar onset, meaning onset uh, in, in the bulbar area with uh, symptoms such as difficulty speaking or difficulty swallowing, and the rest had uh, limb onset disease, meaning that their first symptoms were either in the arms or the legs. The vast majority of participants were either on Wilusol or Edaravon or both. Uh, and, and this is because we wanted to test the drug uh, allowing the participants to receive standard of care. In other words, we didn't restrict access to the two FDA approved medications for ALS, which are Wilusol and Edaravon. Really this trial was not designed as a head to head comparison between AMX 35 and the other drugs. So this was designed to measure the uh, additive effect of AMX35 on top of standard of care. And so basically we, uh, we allowed participants to, to choose whether they, they wanted to be on Rilusol and Aragon or both. And most people were at least on one of these two medications. So we tested a few things in the trial. Uh, we tested the effect of AMX35 on physical function and we measured that over a six month period. That was the placebo control trial. Uh, we also measured uh, the effect of AMX35 on survival, and that was assessed long-term. Uh, we follow up up to three years. We also tested throughout all of these whether AMX35 was safe and tolerable. So uh, a few words about the study design to, to better understand the results. So these uh, 137 participants were assigned randomly to either active or placebo in a two-to-one ratio. So this means that the AMX35 group was twice as big as the placebo group. Specifically, we assigned 89 people with ALS to AMX35 and 48 people with ALS to placebo. And they remained in this randomized period where they were assigned uh, blindly to either active or placebo for six months. Uh, and it's during this period of time that we evaluated function and safety. And, and those are reported in the first paper uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and, and I will describe those results first. But then I also want to point out that the participants were followed long term uh, up to three years. Uh, and so we started enrolling them in 2017 and, and, and we followed their survival up to the summer of 2020. Um, and of note, uh, throughout this time, the participants who completed 
the randomized period, period we're also given the option to continue on onto something that's called the open label extension. So what this means is that um, at the end of the placebo control trial, when participants were randomized to either active or placebo, uh, they were given the option to receive active drug long term uh, if they wanted to. That was optional. So uh, they, they were then followed long term up to three to three years um, uh, on this active drug. And that's when we evaluate this survival. So a few words about uh, the first period, the first six months when we uh, evaluated the physical function of the drug. We, we did that in the placebo control trial uh, by using a tool called the ALS FRSR. You may be familiar with that. When you come to clinic, um, oftentimes we, uh, we, uh, we give this questionnaire, which is a series of 12 questions that basically measure independence with different activities. For example, ability to speak, ability to swallow, ability to, um, to, uh, to write, to turn in bed, to walk, to negotiate stairs, etc. And a score is assigned for each of the 12 activities on a scale from zero to four for each question. Zero means function absent and four means function normal. So because we have, again, the scoring system zero to four for each question and we have 12 questions, the maximum score is 48. So, so basically what we did was we took you know, a group of people uh, and gave them AMX 35. Another group of people gave them placebo, followed them for six months and evaluated this questionnaire uh, every few weeks uh, for six, up to six months. So what we saw was that, uh, was the following, the treatment with AMX 35 slowed down the rate of decline in this uh, ALS FRSR total score. Now the people who took AMX 35 over the first six months are labeled in red at the top, and the people who took placebo are labeled in blue at the bottom. Now, as you can see, both people progressed. So the drug didn't completely stop or reverse uh, the disease. However, it did slow it down significantly. Specifically, uh, the rate of progression in people who took AMX 35 was slower. It was 1.24 points per month compared to 1.66 points per month uh, compared you know, uh, in placebo. And so essentially what this means is that people who received AMX 35 had the same ALS FRSR score uh, after 24 weeks of treatment as those in the placebo group did at week 16. So they retained their function. So in, in a way that we could um, sort of quantify by saying there was a six week increase in retained function. We can also express the same results in a different way. Uh, so we, uh, if you compare the, the, the total score uh, over a six month period, you know, we, again, we saw that people who received the AMX 35 declined less than those who received placebo corresponding to a 2.32 point uh, absolute difference at the end of the six month period. So essentially the people who received the AMX 35 had a score that was 2.32 points higher than people who received placebo. Now, so because we saw that people did better over six months in terms of uh, retention of function, we wanted to see what would happen to them over the long term in terms of survival. So again, there was an initial randomized period when people were assigned to either active or placebo the first six months. And over that period, we saw that uh, longer retention of function in people who took the drug. And then we followed them long term up to July 20, 2020 to check differences in survival. One important point is that the trial design was patient-centric in the sense that at the end of the randomized period, we allowed people, whether they were on active drug or placebo during the preceding six months, we allowed them to receive access to the active drug as part of the open label extension. So in the end, uh, in addition, you know, the people who were originally on AMX 35 continued on AMX 35, but the people who were on placebo, after six months, if they wanted to, they started receiving active drug. So we compare the people who were originally randomized to AMX 35, uh, those 89 individuals, to the people who were originally randomized to placebo, 48 people. And we use public records to measure the survival in everyone uh, up to three years. Uh, really, it was 35 months, but uh, only two weeks shy of 36 months, so almost three years, with a cutoff date of July 20, 2020. So what we saw 
was that the people who were originally randomized to AMX35 lived on average 6.5 months longer than the people originally randomized to placebo. And, and this effect was independent of baseline use of Riluzol and or Edaravon. In other words, we saw these, um, these survival effects independently of the use of other medications. So in summary, in the, in the center trial, the, the administration of AMX35 resulted in a functional benefit, meaning that there was slowing of uh, progression of the ALS-FRSR, and also long-term survival benefit, meaning that the people who were originally randomized to AMX35, the ones who started taking the drug earlier, had a, a longer median survival. And these effects were seen on top of standard of care, meaning the use of Riluzol, Edaravon, or both. So to, to summarize, uh, you know, these are, these are findings that I think are substantial because they, they show that we were able to um, have a positive effect on both function and survival. The two things should go hand in hand, and in fact, they did in the trial. And then really, we are making some progress in the fight against ALS, and we're thinking about combination treatment uh, to, uh, to really try to um, make positive impacts in the disease. So thank you, and I would be happy to take your questions. Terrific, thank you. Um, I think, you know, we had sort of written that we'd do a Q&A at the end, but I think while Suma is getting her talk ready, this would be a great time to answer a few of the questions that came up. Um, so th the first one is, <laughs> this is a great one. I, I thank you for asking this question. Um, what is the difference between Tudka and Terso? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. I know it's very confusing. Uh, so essentially they are the same molecule. It's just a difference in nomenclature because, uh, so basically Tadka uh, was the name of the molecule uh, as it was known internationally, uh, but then uh, it was not really defined uh, as, a, as a drug in the US. And so the, basically there was a new nomenclature. There is an agency that's responsible for naming compounds, molecules, uh, and basically they changed the name to Terso. So it's a, a it's very Shakespearean arose by any other name. Yeah. Um, so. Um, so there's another question, uh, Sabrina, will there be a new AMX0035 clinical trial outside the USA? Yeah, that's another great question. So essentially, we are still evaluating all options for this drug. Uh, there's a lot of ongoing conversations with regulatory groups uh, globally. So not only the FDA in the US, but also uh, the corresponding groups in Europe, Japan, Canada, and so the outcome of all these conversations will, will basically dictate whether uh, you know, the drug can be approved, can be given via expanded access, or whether a new trial is required, and, and where that trial, if required, will take place. So again, I think uh, everything is still on the table, and, and, and I hope that you know, we, uh, we can share uh, news with you over the next few weeks. And that, um, Sabrina, I think gets to two additional questions we had. One is how long before it becomes available to people with ALS. I think the answer is that uh, you know, people are working very, very hard on this. We're hopeful, um, but we don't have exactly a timeline. Is that a I, I think you're right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I wish I could give a more firm timeline. Uh, I would say that uh, this process or these conversations also imply review of, of thousands of pages, really. So, so essentially, uh, the company is now submitting all, you know, all the documents uh, for the relevant authorities to review, uh, and then um, hopefully move forward um, in a positive direction. And I think a, a related question: Has any progress been made uh, with the FDA on fast tracking this? And I, I think, it, you know. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same kind of concept. So uh, basically, so depending on the outcome uh, of these conversations, then different options, uh, you know, um, may become available in different territories in the US and, 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 and elsewhere. Uh, so uh, all of this basically, you know, uh, it's gonna all be discussed with the regulatory groups. Great. A couple of methodologic questions here. Um, how, how many that were in the center placebo group opted into the OLE continuation study? Is that really, I think, a great question? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So, uh, so the people were, you know, people had to complete six months uh, in the trial before g being given the option of entering into the open label extension. And so we had 98 people who completed six months on drug. And of those 90, 90 
enter the open label extension. So essentially the vast majority or 92% of people who completed the, uh, the six months on drug opted to get into the open label extension. Um, there's a, another question. Are there any significant drug interactions or food interactions expected with AMX over free file? Yeah, not, not much really. Uh, so that's, I think that's a positive feature of the drug that it doesn't really require too much, uh, you know, there isn't too much concern in terms of lab monitoring or EKG monitoring. There's nothing like that. There's really no interactions with the most commonly used medications. Uh, there's a couple of interactions with very rare medications not used, you know, not really used in our patient uh, community that much. Uh, there's some HIV drugs, a couple of other um, antiepileptic drugs. But again, that, um, even for people who need those, again, they, they, would, they would have other options. So, so very minimal uh, drug-drug interactions. And no really, so in terms of the food, so we ask people People to take um, the the drug before a meal. However, they could eat right afterwards. Uh, so again, there isn't a, a very specific, uh, you know, food interaction that we know of. Great. Um, so Molly, Mirna has had her hand up for some time. We haven't been able to sort of investigate that. Could could you look into maybe unmuting Mirna to see if um, maybe a May come back to that. Um, I think now, Mirna, you could unmute yourself to ask a question if, if you wanted, and, and there may just be a confusion about that about the race hand as well. Um, last one, and then we'll and then we'll go on to Suma's um, talk that we're excited for. Has has the petition been filed with the FDA yet? I actually don't know. The, the petition was uh, organized by the ALS Association. I know they um, uh, there was a respectful petition, and I know they collected uh, thousands of, of signatures. Uh, I don't know if it was physically filed uh, yet or not, um, but uh, but again, I think it's part of the process of the discussions with the FDA. Great. Thank you for the really wonderful, insightful, and thoughtful questions, Suma. Um, uh, we're excited to hear your um, slides about the, the, this, the really, really exciting results and path forward for a person. Thank you, James. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Again, I just want to make sure that everybody is able to uh, see the slides okay. And uh, it, it looks uh, big enough for some reason. I can't uh, see the comments as well as the slides on the same screen on my computer. Um, yeah, so my, I had a similar problem. So we'll, um, We'll, let, we'll, we'll interrupt you and just let you know if we, if we get any questions. It looks okay to us. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited to share the results of the phase one slash two trial of Tofersin for SAD1 ALS. Uh, before we talk about the details of the trial and the results, I must uh, share that I, I, I share the excitement that other panelists have uh, expressed throughout the symposium today about the therapeutic development for ALS. Um, and I also share the excitement of being a part of uh, this wonderful uh, MGH ALS team where uh, we really uh, focus on patient care and patient access to experimental therapeutics at the front and center of all our efforts. Um, so the, um, the Tofersin trial results were recently published just a few months ago uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, this is a experimental um, medication that um, was developed uh, by Biogen and the collaborator was um, Ionis who developed the ASO. The top line result of this trial was that Tofersin is safe. And uh, in addition to showing changes in the SOD1 protein levels in people who have the SOD1 um, mutation positive ALS, uh, there was also some early signals of slowing of SOD1 ALS disease progression. So what is Tofersin and how does it work? Um, so Fersin, uh, also known as uh, BIIB067, is an experimental anti-sense oligonucleotide. For short, we call it as ASO. Um, it is an experimental medication for people who have the SOD1 genetic mutation and have ALS from the SOD1 mutation. Um, as um, uh, you may all know that the genetic forms of ALS form a really small subset of um, all patients who have ALS. And SOD1 particularly accounts for less than 5% of all cases of ALS. Some forms of SOD1 ALS can be very aggressive. And Tofersin is a gene therapy approach um, for um, such individuals who have the SOD1 mutation and ALS from that. 
a quick recap of uh, biology and how to first act. So if you zoom into the motor neuron, zoom into the nucleus of the motor neuron cell, um, we have the DNA, which is the genetic uh, blueprint. And if you again further zoom in, there are several genes. One of the genes we'll call gene one as our SOD1 gene. And if you uh, zoom further into the gene, a SOD1 gene, there is a DNA uh, code, and uh, this DNA code is specific for that particular gene. And um, the, there's an mRNA that reads this code and brings that information outside of the nucleus into the cell of the motor neuron and uh, eventually forms the protein. In, um, so this is the central dogma of, um, of uh, uh, DNA. Um, uh, in SOD1 ALS, there is a typo or a mistake in that particular gene, which will say that this is the orange highlighted um, uh, code in the DNA. So the RNA that's reading this code is now reading it wrong and uh, it's producing uh, a faulty protein, which is toxic and it's excessive in amount and it all accumulates within the motor neuron. And so the motor neuron is now um, uh, sort of trying to survive in a toxic environment and, um, and ultimately causes damage and death of that cell. So fersen is an antisense oligo or ASO. It's sort of a lock and key mechanism that binds to that faulty RNA readout, and it prevents um, the RNA from forming the protein or the faulty protein. Now, it uh, uh, allows the motor neuron to survive without the excessive accumulation of that faulty um, toxic SOD1 protein within the cell. So um, what, what did we learn about the phase one to first in trial in SOD1 ALS? So this was a phase one slash two trial that was run at several centers. 50 participants who carried the SOD1 mutation participated in the trial. Um, and based on safety, the dosage of tofersin was increased starting from 20 milligrams all the way to 100 milligrams. And it was tested in various different cohorts. Each participant in the phase one slash two trial received five doses of the drug versus placebo. And this drug was administered via spinal tap or intrathecal administration uh, each time. And all participants who completed the trial had the uh, opportunity to roll over into the open label extension where there's no placebo, they get the, 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 the real drug uh, on an ongoing basis and this trial is still ongoing. What we found, what we learned from this trial is that among various different dosages tested, 20, 40, 60, and 100, the 100 milligram dosage, the highest dose, uh, reduced the toxic SOD1 protein levels um, by about 33% as measured in the spinal fluid compared to placebo group where there was only a 3% reduction and this was as early as day 85, less than three months. And what this 33% means is based off of preclinical studies, this is a clinically meaningful reduction in the toxic protein. Um, and uh, so these are very exciting results. Um, also, when we looked at the clinical um, outcomes, uh, being a phase one or two uh, study, this is not confirmatory. Uh, safety and tolerability, as you all know, is the, uh, the main outcome in this trial, but they also looked at the ALS FRSR as well as vital capacity changes over the treatment duration as, ex um, as exploratory outcomes, and the results there were also um, very exciting. Um, on the left column is the total ALS FRSR score, and the right column is the vital capacity. The top panel is all patients in um, um, all patients, regardless of their rate of disease progression combined. And the bottom panel is looking at only the fast progressing um, individuals within uh, the trial. What we learned is that by at, uh, day 85, to first and at the highest dosage, 100 milligram dosage, um, 10 people received that highest dosage. Um, as highlighted in orange, um, slowed, uh, had a slowing of ALS FRSR decline compared to placebo um, shown in blue. While patients who received the tofersin had only a 1.2 point reduction in ALS FRSR over three months, people who received the placebo had close to a six point reduction during the same time period. Um, and similarly with vital capacity, people who received the highest dosage of tofersin at 100 milligram dosage um, dropped about seven points in their vital capacity score over the three month period. And in comparison, people who received the placebo dropped about 15 points during the same time, period, uh, time frame. 
Um, so this only um, goes to show that um, tofurcin has a potential to slow ALS uh, efforts, um, a slow um, the decline of ALS disease progression, both by functional outcomes uh, as well as uh, respiratory outcomes as well. The bottom panel, looking specifically at the fast progressing subgroup, showed that the difference between the groups was even um, more substantial compared to the overall um, cohort that participated in the trial. And in terms of safety, tofurcin um, was largely safe, uh, well tolerated at all dosages. This is directly from the paper listing all the side effects or adverse events that um, patients experienced while participating in the trial. The summary of this is that most uh, participants experienced mild to moderate uh, spinal tap or lumbar puncture related uh, side effects, um, mostly in the form of uh, some procedural pain um, or um, post lumbar puncture um, headache um, and, and uh, symptoms like that, but mo none of these symptoms were um, severe. Um, and in addition, there were some asymptomatic increases in spinal fluid protein and white count levels. Um, again, these were um, asymptomatic, no patient developed side of uh, symptoms from, um, from, the, uh, from the lab abnormalities noted. So in conclusion, um, for patients who have SOD1 positive ALS, so first in at 100 milligram dosage, which is the highest dosage is safe and, uh, and well tolerated, um, as we learned from the phase one slash two trial. And uh, at this dosage, there was a significant reduction in the toxic SOD1 protein um, in, as measured in the spinal fluid. And um, the trial, even within that small cohort of 50 participants, showed um, signals of benefit in slowing the disease progression. So where is this headed? Um, before we talk about the next steps, I, I do want to mention uh, the timeline for development of such an exciting treatment, um, such as Tofersen for SOD1. Um, and a, a, a therapeutic development like this doesn't happen overnight. And uh, th there were a series of very systematically conducted experiments that ultimately led to the current trial um, that's ongoing at the moment. Um, so the SOD1 gene was discovered in 1993, and then there were a series of uh, preclinical experiments. The very first human trial of SOD1 ASO was um, uh, was uh, completed in 2012, and uh, the paper was published then. Um, and that was a first generation SOD1 ASO. And since then, there was a more potent second generation um, SOD1 ASO was developed, and that's the Tofersen. And the phase one slash two trial started in 2016, and that paper was published uh, this year. And now we are in phase three trial of Tofersen for SOD1 ALS. And I just wanted to highlight this picture. This picture was from uh, M&D Symposium in Scotland two years ago, um, that uh, when the Tofersen development team received uh, the Healy Innovation Award um, and in includes all the key members who are involved in development of Tofersen from the start uh, to its current date. So what's next for um, genetic ALS? So as I mentioned earlier, Tofersen is currently in phase three trial, and the name of that trial is Valor, and uh, Biogen is uh, uh, running this trial, and MGH is a site, um, and there are thir 38 sites across um, uh, US, Europe, and Canada uh, where this uh, study is being conducted at the moment, and uh, this study is actually nearing the target enrollment uh, of 60 SOD1 positive ALS participants, um, so um, this is very exciting. Uh, and the dose that moved forward into the phase three trial is the highest dose that showed benefit in the phase one slash two trial, which is 100 milligram dosage. Um, so any participant who has a SOD1 positive mutation, um, uh, uh, you know, if, if anyone in the audience has a mutation interest in participating in the trial, uh, definitely reach out to me or um, any of our colleagues and we'll be happy to um, navigate through the eligibility um, and screening. Um, and this is a, a placebo control portion um, and has about six months in the placebo control portion followed by open label extension, which is ongoing for about four and a half years. So. Um, so first in our SOD1 ASO is one example of potential targets for ALS. Uh, there are many targets just like the SOD1 ALS. Just in the past decade, there have been over 10 ALS genes that have been discovered since the Ice Bucket Challenge. And uh, what that also translates to is that there are 10 potential targets for genetic forms of ALS. Currently, there is another ASO trial that's ongoing for C9 positive ASO, which is a phase one trial and we are a site. Um, and very soon we'll be starting another ASO trial for a different genetic form of um, ALS called ATAXIN2. 
uh, and we're hoping to um, start this study uh, as early as um, uh, early 2021. So if, um, uh, you know, this only goes to show that there's more and more a genetic, um, uh, the knowledge about genetic um, abnormalities that's uh, growing in the field of ALS, please uh, consult with your neurologist to see if genetic testing or uh, genetic um, uh, gene therapy trials uh, might be the right approach um, for you. That's my last slide. I'll stop there. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Suma. Really exciting program. Thanks for giving us the whole overview of the program. There are a couple of questions that are that are coming in. Um, thank you to everyone who's asking these questions, really keeping it, I think, exciting. So the 100 milligram cohort results look great, but has there been any testing at even higher dosing amounts? As far as I know, there has not been uh, a higher dosage that has been tested. Certainly, um, I think, you know, looking at those results, one would, you know, wonder whether they're, whether, you know, even in high, a higher dose might, might be beneficial. Um, some of the animal work has shown that you can get the benefits with a, very much a partial knockdown and there is kind of a ceiling effect, so you don't need to knock down um, all the way and actually knock out animals so when you completely use other genetic techniques to get rid of the SOD1 gene, um, have, they do okay, but, but they do have some problems. Um, so, uh, but, but you know, there will be a question that we optimize this. So it's, a great, it's a great question. So another question is, would tofersin be even more effective coupled with a treatment that promotes autophagy to remove the buildup of toxic protein? Um, I may start and then, you know, Suma, if you wanted to add to it. So it's a, this is a really great question. So one of the things that we see with SOD1 and Newton SOD1 is that we get uh, sort of these sticky accumulations of the protein within the cell, and that may be one of the ways that it's causing a problem. We know that the, muta the mutated protein causes the disease just by being around. We don't know exactly how. Um, so. Tim Miller is doing some studies along with Katie Nicholson at our center to look at the half-life of the, of the protein. And if that half-life is long enough, then it would probably, you know, it would be great to kind of clear it out. If the half-life is um, shorter, as we think, on a, on a you know, matter of kind of days until we get rid of it, it may not be necessary. And it is a little tricky to mess with autophagy. Autophagy is kind of the garbage system for the cell getting rid of misfolded proteins. So, you know, maybe putting in more garbage collectors would help, but you can also cause, you know, it's a, you'd want to be careful about that. It's a, it's a great scientific question, I think, as well. Um, next question is, uh, do you think that all ALS patients should, should get gene tested? Um, I, I think uh, maybe I'll start. Other merit, you may want to weigh in as well. I, I think, I think the answer, my answer to this has changed in the last few years. Um, it's something that we're wrestling with, not only in ALS but in neurology, and not just in neurology but in all of medicine. Um, but in ALS, you know, we now know of most, the the majority, beyond the majority, uh, of most genes that cause ALS, and there are still some rare ones that that we don't know about because there are some families that have familial ALS and. We don't know what gene causes it, so we can't be completely inclusive. But I think we know of enough that um, it is a really important tool. And we have we have two, soon to be three, um, and there will be more uh, treatment trials directed at genes. And so I think I think that we're moving to an era where gene testing is becoming much more standard. Yeah, I agree. I think we should be testing everybody for the the known genes. Um, and uh, you know, fortunately, the cost has come down a lot, and often insurance company covers. But they're, they're beginning to be actionable for for particular trials. And then I think there is a lot of research. You know, Dr. Dickelson is leading, um, you know, with Tim Miller and others, the dial study to follow people um, who might be at risk, uh, uh, who, whose parents might have uh, a familiar form, to try to really get the data that we need to be able to design prevention trials. Um, so I think that that's also really important. Um, and 
another really great question from John. Uh, how would positive phase three results of the SOD1 study impact the pace of the C9 study that's still in phase one? Would they potentially accelerate the C9 trial timeframe? So one thing, one thing that's I think important to say is that, you know, yes, any success I think um, has a, a beneficial effect on, on any other trial that's going on. Um, Antisense oligonucleotides are, are kind of these small pieces of name DNA. And while there are some what we call class effects of them, there's some things that we understand about all of them, they're actually all really quite individual in, in their, their risks and potential benefits and their targets. And so I think it, it, there probably isn't an exact way that a success with, with one is going to exactly hasten the other one. But the more comfortable we all are with the, any of the class effects, absolutely, and trial designs, by the way, absolutely better. I don't know if, if uh, some of you, you want to expand or merit. I, I agree with you. I think, um, you know, fortunately, the company companies involved here, I think, are, are large enough that they don't have to wait for the results of one to have the financial resource to do another. So I do think they're, they're working on these in parallel. Um, but, you know, the more we learn on it, you know, it's going to help not just the familiar form, even the sporadic form as we learn about these technologies of how to modulate uh, genes in people safely. Yeah. I, I guess I want to make one other, one other really key point here, which is that uh, because for many of the people viewing, um, you know, they may have sporadic ALS rather than familial ALS. The tools that these, these antisense oligonucleotide tools are first being employed against, against genes that cause, you know, a specific familial form of, of ALS. But there are genes that we're learning about that actually may be causative for what appears to be uh, sporadic ALS, or by turning up or down genes, we might be able to slow progression of ALS in sporadic ALS. And so I think keeping a, a weather eye on these, uh, these gene-directed therapies could be really important for the entire community. James, that's a great point you bring up. And uh, also to kind of point that the, the ataxin 2 trial that we are hoping to start very soon um, is actually looking at um, uh, also not just people who carry the familial type of ataxin repeat expansion, but also um, based off of some preclinical studies that some sporadic ALS patients may have intermediate repeat expansions as well. So potentially they could benefit from the ASO as well. Right, really key point. So we're turning that corner from just, you know, from sort of focusing on a very small subset of people with ALS to, to really applying these transformative techniques to, to everyone. Okay. Um, certainly we, we have a couple more minutes if people want to um, add in questions while, while we talk, that's great. I, I have to say, you know, um, we love to get together in person and this is an event we look forward to every year in person because it gives us a chance to talk and, and mingle and share and, and um, really be a clinic community. At the same time, I know that we all were looking forward to this, to sharing it. It gives us a chance to look back on, on the year. This is only a partial list of some of the things that, that have been exciting this year. Um, and I want to thank all of the speakers, but more importantly, I want to thank everyone who joined in the audience. Um, you know, many of the questions that came up are, are questions that you'll want to talk about with your, with your care team, with your research team, uh, with any of us, and we're more than happy to do that. Um, we look forward to a, a really, really exciting 2021 as well. Um, I want to this is uh, there's one last question that came in and I think it would be a, a really good way to to end to maybe talk about this um, what is the reason that we aren't further along with research um, and and how well funded is the disease and is funding something that that sort of um, could help hasten the pace of discovery and you know Merritt I might hand this over to you for sort of the last word of the day here to, to answer that question for us and, and tell us what it meant for the platform trial and could mean for other programs. Sure, it's a really good question. And I, I'd say there's a couple of reasons we're not further along. I, and with the caveat that we're so much further than we used to be. And what I think one is that uh, there weren't a lot of people studying this illness until the last, I'd say five, six years. Um, now there's tons, and, and like I said, there's tons of companies in the space, and it, it is this forward momentum. The more you learn about the illness, the more you attract people into the field. Um, 
and there really wasn't a lot of funding in the past and that's changed so there's still not enough and and, and then i say the third issue is that we didn't have the technologies needed to study um kind of not just ALS, but other brain diseases like the good imaging or the ways to see the motor neurons in the person. So um, as we've gotten those better technologies, more money and more people in it, it the, the pace is going up a lot. So I think we're going to we're going to keep seeing a lot more. But um, funding is really key and, and kind of philanthropic and uh, funding that comes um, quickly to the really good ideas. As I said, we depend on federal funding, and there is probably 78 to $80 million a year coming you know, to ALS research from the NIH, which is great, but it takes an awful long time to, to apply to get it. And it's also usually for less risky type of research. And I, I think it's a, what philanthropy does is, is allow people with great ideas to get off the ground really quickly. Uh, they're still reviewed, it's just faster. I mean, one, one foundation you know, I, I work with is ALS Finding a Cure It, and from day one, it was about no red tape. Their contracts are one page. They fund the best people. They fund them fast. They ask for you know re results back, and they 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 have to be shared, but they don't get tied up in a lot of red tape. Uh, so I, I think the more that we can have those type of support, the faster progress is going to is going to go. That's great. We we have one or two more questions coming in, but I think we'll try to answer those offline. And um, and I think this is a good good time for us to to. To wrap up thank you so much everybody thank you all for being here we, we really are looking forward to a, a really successful exciting 2021 thank all you everybody bye-bye